We started this study talking about the idea of fixer-upper, not this semester, but last semester, the whole idea of rebuilding and fixing things up. And my goodness, did we see unfold in real time in the news this week a brand new fixer-upper project as the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris went up in smoke and for 12 hours it burned. For 12 hours, a monument that wasn't just considered a national monument, but really was a World Heritage Site, went up in smoke. And when it was done, what was left was a shell. All of the wooden beams, the roof, the spire, much of the artwork, the interior, everything was burned up. In fact, as the news unfolded, we found out lots of interesting things about the Cathedral in Notre Dame, things that we probably none of us have ever thought about. It actually was undergoing renovation at the time. A $6.8 million renovation was underway. And this was interesting, that experts that they interviewed said that the cathedral actually needed massive amounts of repair long before the fire set in because they said, this is a quote, that it had been centuries of neglect in the making. One heritage expert said that that kind of um, disaster, he said, was bound to happen, something that they should have expected. One middle-aged expert said that um, not enough had been spent on the maintenance of the building at any time in history. And another quote, I went up to the foot of the spire before the renovations began. Some of the brickwork was disjointed and it was held in place by a grate that was also falling apart. The lack of real upkeep and daily attention to such a major building is the cause of the catastrophe. And that was the president of the Scientific Council of the National Heritage Institute. Let me just read that again. Lack of real upkeep and daily attention. This is what happened to Israel. What a metaphor. Here we are, uh, a nation that God himself was building, and because they refused to give the attention that God commanded of them. They just wanted to put a little reno job in. They found themselves in dire predicament. It was interesting because now the news is saying that within five years they want to have the cathedral fixed. But the experts are saying, well, you may be able to rebuild, but you're not going to be able to rebuild that cathedral. In fact, you don't even have the resources available anymore to rebuild it. They talked about the fact that the beams that held up the roof were 800 years old and were made from a forest that no longer exists. He says, we don't even have the trees in the territory of the size that were cut in the 13th century. Instead, he said, the roof and the restoration work will have to use new technology. I just think this is such an analogy for Israel. They are at a place now coming back into the land desperately trying to rebuild something that existed before. And as we're going to see as we studied this uh, section of Malachi, but also as we studied all of the prophets that have spoken to these in Israel, they're going to need a new technology. <laughs> they can't build what they had before. It isn't even in God's plan for them to build what they had before. Instead, he had a desire to build something new, and the prophets had pointed that out. And they aren't the only prophets that pointed that out. Going back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. For I will be merciful to the unrighteous and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. This is going to be a whole new plan. God specifically says, I love that, he calls them the house of Israel. God is still building a house in Israel. The foundation is good, but everything else has got to go. God is saying to them, there is a foundation. You are my house, but we're going to build with new materials. In fact, we're actually going to build with a new builder. builder. Jeremiah 3.18. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations will be gathered in Jerusalem to honor the name of the Lord. They will no longer follow their stubbornness of their evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah will walk with the house of Israel, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land I have given them to their ancestors as an inheritance. Uh, this was God's fixer-upper plan. God's fixer-upper plan was to build a whole new house, but to build it on the same foundation. 
Um, he had built that house of Israel up over centuries. It took 200 years to build the cathedral. It took God hundreds of years to build this house. And he said this was a house that other nations were going to be blessed by. And his desire was to keep that rough plan. They were still going to be his people. They were still going to be a nation and a house that others were going to be blessed by. And we see through this look where he's called them back into the land, one of the things that we see is that God is still giving them the opportunity to build along with him, to help him. But they aren't going to be the only builders. We're going to see that this is going to take a new kind of builder. Um, I love this picture of this story that came out of Notre Dame as well. There were just so many wonderful parallels and analogies in this story. One of the stories that came out was the reality that when they first developed the plan for the cathedral, it's not like you build a plan today. If I build a house, I can plan on six months. If I build a major building in New York City, it might be done in three years. This plan initially was planned out for about 200 years to get this cathedral up. And what that meant was that the craftsmen who initially began the plan knew that they were not going to live long enough to see it through. And yet they still committed all of their lives to it. And more than that, because they wanted the integrity of the building to stick with the original plan, they actually trained up their own sons to learn the work alongside of them, to apprentice with them. And then when they were dead and buried, their sons would be the craftsmen to carry on the same vision in the same way, with the same commitment. And you know what they did? They raised up their sons, and they taught their sons their craft, so that when they were dead and buried, there would be another generation who would carry on the vision and the work. That was God's plan for Israel. Over and over again, Deuteronomy 6, he was so specific. Train up your children. Teach them your ways. Write it on their foreheads. When they sit down and when they rise up and when they lie down and they walk along the way, teach them, pass this from generation to generation so that they will be builders of a nation too. And as we've looked at some of the history of Israel before they were taken in captivity, we know that that's not what they did. Generation upon generation forgot the vision and there were cracks in the walls One of the interesting details about the cathedral was that even though there was an original plan, there were certain things that the planners just either didn't know or didn't account for. Before it was ever finished and the walls were up, they started noticing cracks in those large facades of the walls. And so when we look at the modern day cathedral, what we see are these, they're called flying buttresses. These great big, they almost look like... um, uh, uh, beams that would go down that would hold them like this. They were stone. Well, those were added after the fact. They were not part of the original design to make up for the unanticipated flaws in the building. As we look at Israel, I think we see that over and over again. We see that God had given them a design and yet it wasn't carried out with perfection. And over and over again, we see the cracks in Israel's desire, the cracks in their heart, the cracks in their commitment, even to the point that they abandoned the work altogether. And that led them where? Into captivity. Seventy years later, they do get to come back into the land. At first, they're all gung-ho to get started. Um, We studied Ezra all the way through Malachi. And what we find is they're doing too little too late. Um, The renovation that was budgeted for $6.8 $6.8 million. One commentator I heard said more like they needed $106 million. Um, they were doing too little in order to maintain something, to recreate something the way it was supposed to be. Israel is doing the same thing. Too little, too late. They're coming in, they're trying to build, and they're trying to do it with the minimal amount of effort possible. We watch over and over again in Israel as one minute they're gung-ho and the next minute they've fallen back. And one minute they're trying again, and the next minute it's just too hard. And one minute they're giving to the Lord, and the next minute they're giving him blind birds. It's just too hard. Their commitment isn't with it. How did they get as far as they did? How is it that they had a temple and a rebuilt city and rebuilt walls? Well, what really shines out in our study, what I hope 
that we walk away with after all of these months from Ezra all the way through Malachi is not Israel's faithfulness, but God's faithfulness to his promises. That's really the story of the remnant. The story is that God is committed not only to his people and his purposes, but he's committed to the work that he wants to accomplish. Um, Malachi 3.6, we were reminded in very succinct words, the Lord himself says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Those are powerful words. They were not where they were back in the house, still part of God's plan because of their faithfulness or their investment in building the house, their commitment to excellence. They're back in the land where they are because God is faithful to his promise. Girls, that ought to encourage us. When we look around at the world that we see and we're discouraged and everything seems to be going up in flames and we feel like the people of Israel, look, the wicked are getting rewarded, then we can look and we can say, God is faithful to his promises. It won't depend on man's obedience. Ultimately, it will depend on God's faithfulness. So that's where he found them. They were delivered from the exile. They were preserved as a people. They were restored to the land. Um, they were worshiping in the temple, all because of God's steadfast love. I love Ezra 9, thinking back all the way to Ezra. And he says, but now for a brief moment, the Lord has been gracious in leaving a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. I love that insight. But now for a brief moment, it's the Lord who's been gracious. In the big scheme of things, the time they spent actually is going to be a brief moment. We know just through history that they're actually going to be exiled from the land permanently for 2,000 years. That 70 years will seem like nothing. It was a brief moment, and yet God was still working his plan. We got to see Zerubbabel and Jeshua and Ezra and Esther and Mordecai and Nehemiah all play a role, just like their forefathers, in trying to catch God's vision and pass it on to other people. But the time was near for not them to build, but for a new builder. Um, we get the idea that their work is going to be insufficient, as God honestly chronicles time after time the failure. If you'll remember uh, how both Ezra and Nehemiah ended, you just think, ah, oh, they're back in the land. This is going so great. And then you see how each of those books ends. A list of all of the places where they stop being faithful in marriages, in sacrifices, um, in the priesthood, on the Sabbath. Each one of those stories that tells how they are back in the land reminds us of their unfaithfulness. So what is it going to take? What will it take to put the house right? That's where those books leave us. They leave us saying, well, if they can't do it, what's it going to take? Psalm 127.1. Psalm 121, 7, 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. There's a principle, not just for them, but for us. What God does not build will not stand. Ultimately, what God does not build will not stand. We have these pictures in Malachi 3 where God says through Malachi that he's going to come and he is going to be like a refiner's fire and a purifying soap. And it reminds us of Corinthians that says that those works that are not done on the foundation of Christ, that builder, are going to burn up. They're going to be wood, hay, and stubble. They are going to burn up. We won't burn up, but those things that were not built on Christ that were not built, that God was not part of the builder, they are not going to stand. <clears throat> so whose vision were they working for? Ultimately, Israel was working for Israel's vision. We get that idea told to us once again in Malachi 3, 13 and 14. 
God says to them, your words have been arrogant against me. And they say, what have we spoken against you? And you have said, the Lord says, it is in vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we keep his charge and that we have walked mourning before the Lord? At the end of the day for them, they couldn't find the profit in it. They couldn't find where it benefited them to serve the Lord. They were counting not their cost, they were counting the benefits. The exact opposite of what the Lord says. Count the cost and serve me anyway. And yet Israel had gotten to the place that not only were they building what they wanted, they were looking for the benefit in it. There's a great story of a little boy in a country store and the little boy goes every day with his mom shopping and whenever he's there the storekeeper always says will you you take a handful of candy son I want you to have it and the little boy always stands with his hands in his pocket and the storekeeper who always knows the little boy for whatever reason won't reach in reaches in himself and grabs a handful and hands it to him and one day the mom said to the little boy why don't you ever reach in he says that you can take it and the little boy said, because his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> That's something Israel didn't get. They didn't get that if they would just be obedient and build according to God's plan, cooperating with him, his hands were bigger. They didn't have to focus on self-interest. That God himself would provide for them. And that's one of our principles. Self-interest will always limit our commitment to God. Do you know when you're grasping to get what you want for you, you can only get what you can get in your power? Get what is God says. I will give you all the riches of heaven are yours. That he wants to give in abundance. That he himself wants to give pressed down, overflowing and shaken together. That's the kind of giving that God does. But self-interest will always limit us if we choose to take what we can get. And that's what Israel was doing. Um, their rebuilding had limits because they had limits. They would only go so far. They would only do so much. They looked around. They saw evil being blessed. They saw their enemies. They worried about how they were going to take care of themselves. And time and time again, if you'll remember, they abandoned the work to go take care of their own needs, their own self-interest. And so that makes us have to ask this question as we think about the people and the way they live in this remnant. <laughs> we also face difficult circumstances. I mean, we see people who are unrighteous, who seem to get away with it. More than that, who seem to be blessed by it. We suffer with illness. We go through poverty. We have hardships. We have question marks. And so what is our response to that? Since I don't have the answers, do I take care of myself and look out for number one? Or are we willing to still surrender that? Have that open hand policy with the Lord to say, what you provide, that's what I'll take. Does your commitment have limits? As we look at the remnant and we see the great cost of self-interest, where are your limits? Would you be willing to commit your heart today to be a builder with him no matter what? And trust that he's going to provide anything and everything that you need. <clears throat> he is the builder and those who try to build without him, build in vain. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. And you knew those jobs needed to be done, so you're not surprised. So right, that's your limit, right? You're okay with that. But presently, C.S. Lewis says, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense to you. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Throwing out a new wing here, putting up an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage. But he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in himself. Where are your limits when it comes to what God wants to do in your life, in your heart, and in your character? The remnant had their limits. God would ask us to throw open the doors, to let him come in and be the builder. 
We might just want a renovation, a little fixer-upper. God may build an entirely new thing. Not only did we get a chance to look at the people of the remnant, but we spent some time looking at the prophets of the remnant. The prophets were the ones privileged to hear directly from God and be able to pass on his word to the people. They were the first ones to hear from God that not only was he building, but that he was building something new. Um, Like the prophets before them, they were bringing not just a message of correction, they were bringing a message of hope. This should have been good news to the people. And through prophet after prophet, including Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the three we looked at, he gave this message, I'm sending a new builder. I'm sending a new builder. You have a handout where you have listed all of the prophecies about this new builder just from the three books that we read. How gracious is God that in these last days before he chooses to reveal nothing new, look how many times he reminded them in that just 100 year period that a new builder was coming, that the house was broken down, the walls were broken down, not the physical, the spiritual, and he was going to send a new builder. How gracious is God, and yet this climax was still going to be 400 years in the future. Haggai said that the Messiah was going to come to the temple. Zechariah said that he would be a priest and that he would be a king. Um, He would be the cornerstone of all that God was going to build. Even though it was 400 years in the future, it was sure. And then they entered into this period that we watched a little bit of on the video this morning. 400 years in which the history of mankind did what the history of mankind always does. It goes topsy-turvy. It's chaotic. It's power struggles. And Israel was in the midst of that. And yet they didn't have a new word from God. But what they did have was a word from God. A psalm that we're familiar with, most of us learn because we learned it when we were little, is Psalm 119.105. Your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. When do you need a lamp? When do you need light? When it's dark. They entered into 400 years of a kind of darkness, a period in which no new word of the Lord came. And yet God said, I've given you a lamp for the darkness. I've given you a light so that you won't stumble. Psalm 1, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Its leaf will not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. Um, They had what scholars like to term a period of silence, but God was not silent. Because whoever has his word has the voice of God. One of the questions in your study this week asked specifically, when have you felt that you were in a season of silence? That's a great question because the key is when have we felt that we were in a season of silence? The truth is those who are faithful, those who belong to the Lord, never have to endure the silence of God. God's faithful people never have to endure the silence of God because we have the word of God. Let me tell you, girls, we live in the same time that they did. If you wanted to, you could call this, if you wanted to, 2,000 years of silence. We don't have prophets who are speaking the new word of God. But what we have is the living word of God. The word of God has always been living. It was living to them and it's living to us. We never have a time where we can look and we can say, I can't hear from God. Now, we may have a sense that God's not listening to us. You've ever heard somebody say, well, I feel like I'm just, my prayers are hitting the ceiling. Go back to what we said earlier as we've studied this. Our feelings are not a determiner of reality. What do we know? That God says, out of Malachi, when you feel that he doesn't hear you, 
It says that to the faithful who love the Lord, who fear Him, He is leaning in. He's not just listening. He is leaning in. And He is recording your thoughts. He hears you. And if you're faithful, you can always hear Him. It's a powerful lesson that we have, that we never have to endure that. Um, there were going to be a lot of roads ahead for Israel that were going to eventually lead them to the time when this new builder comes on the scene. Um, if they had been faithful people who were absorbed in the Word of God, might they have seen some of the things that God said would happen? Might they have seen his hand as the empires were rising and falling as Daniel said they would? Might they have seen that the land would produce for them as they continued to have food to eat, as God said he would do when they were in the land, he said he would bless the land? Might they have seen that the ongoing sacrifices at the temple were yet one more evidence that God had elected them? He had chosen them out of all the peoples of the earth to be in relationship with him. If they were reading, if they were watching the signs of the time, they would have been joyful in hope and faithful to God. The message of those prophets in that time is just as relevant for us today. We're still surrounded by powers that feel like they're permanent, kingdoms that certainly try to tell us that their empire is impermanent. Um, but we're also looking toward a heavenly kingdom. That's what they were looking for. Hebrews 11.10 says that we're to look to a city whose foundation, foundation and whose architect and whose builder is God. Hebrews 12.28 Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer the God acceptable service and reverence in all. There's a great story of Queen Victoria. She's nearing her death, and she was disappointed that the second coming of Christ hadn't happened, and she expressed that. She said, I so wished the Lord had come back while I was alive. And her companions said, why? Why do you wish that so much? And she said, because I wanted to lay my crown at his feet. What is that a beautiful story? What's our acceptable sacrifice? Because we've received a kingdom whose builder and architect is God that can't be shaken like the other kingdoms of the earth, what is our response? Acceptable sacrifice and reverence to God. Return to me and I will return to you. There is a principle. Daily, God's faithful people are guided in daily living by the surety that the promises of God will come to pass. What does your daily life look like? Because we have an architect and a builder who's given us a kingdom that can't be shaken and who has promised to come back. They were looking for his first coming. We live in an in-between time as well. We're looking for a second coming. Are we like Victoria that says, let him come so that my, the, the things that I am responsible for today, I've been so faithful in, I could lay him at his feet if he were to come today and it would be an acceptable sacrifice to him. There's this beautiful picture in Malachi 4. These are the final, almost the final words that he would speak to them, and I love this promise. Not a root or branch will be left to them, but for talking about those who will be judged but you who revere my name, plug your name in there. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample the wicked, then the ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord. Remember the Lord, Moses, the decrees that I gave to Israel. So just get this beautiful picture of a rising sun, beams of righteousness, wings of healing, breaking out of a stall and leaping of calves. What a beautiful picture for those who revere the Lord. This is what we have to look forward to. The sun is not an inanimate object, even though it's spelled S-U-N here. We know that this is S-O-N. It is going to be the sun. Um, Luke 1, uh, starting in verse 76, as Zechariah, who's the father of John the Baptist, he's finally able to talk after not believing that he's going to have a child, and so God strikes him mute, and the first thing he does when he uh, is able to speak again is he prophesies, and th this is what he says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will, be, you will go before the Lord and prepare his ways 
to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of the sins. Because of the tender mercy of God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death. Look at this beautiful picture that's Jesus who's going to fulfill this idea. What does light do? It, it casts out darkness. The day will come when all of the things in this world that are full of darkness, all of the things where truth is hidden and denied will be made known. There'll be beams of righteousness. God is going to make everything right. Do you struggle right now with the injustice and the unrighteousness in the world? That people get away with things? That it seems that even those who mock God are not held to account? The day is coming where God will make all things right. He'll also bring healing. Jesus chose not to heal every illness that he came across. I can't tell you why. And I can't tell you why some of us suffer and are not healed. But I can tell you this. On the day when the Son of Righteousness comes, all things will be healed. Something for us to look forward to. I love the last picture of breaking out of the stall and leaping its calves. <clears throat> it has two ideas. If, if it was a calf that might be stalled up all winter long, all cooped up, just waiting to get out, knowing that the day would come. And then when that day comes, being set free from bondage. But it also has the picture of a calf that might be cooped up because it has been marked for death that has been set free once it's removed from the stall. Either way, both of those are pictures of what he brings to us. But I think maybe my favorite picture is the leaping like calves. I'm an animal person, so um, maybe this appeals to me. But... We're not just going to walk. We're not just going to run. We're going to have the kind of freedom that makes us leap for joy. We're going to prance. <laughs> We're going to dance around. We're going to hop and leap for joy. It brings to mind the picture of David as they were leading the Ark of the Covenant. And David was dancing and laughing and leaping. And his wife is like, what is wrong with him? And yet that will be us, dancing and leaping when he comes. As we come to the end of this season with this house of Israel that God is building and that God himself is going to rebuild. What we find is that, excuse me, what we find is that God is not done. He's still working his plan. And in all of it, he has invited those who are faithful to him to build along with him. But if we build anything, that is not built on the foundation of Christ. It won't last. One of my favorite pictures of the cathedral story was the next morning when they were finally able to put a camera on the inside of the burned out cathedral. And sitting on the altar, completely undisturbed, <coughs> was the gold cross. And when the light hit it, it gleamed. Anything built on the foundation of Christ will endure the fires of judgment. Israel had a lot to learn yet. We saw and we will see as we get into Matthew that they were determined to continue to try to build on a broken and cracked beginning. I don't know what your beginning was like. I don't know when you came into this study with um, faltering walls. Maybe you needed some buttresses to hold you up. But what I do know is, is that when you invite the builder who builds newly, all of those things he can rebuild. But it's him that does the rebuilding, and we are the apprentices. I hope this study's encouraged you. I hope it helps you look forward, not only as Israel looked forward, but we look forward to his coming again, and that we would be faithful to pass on what we know to other people so that generation after generation is part of this new house that he's building. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, just uh, your faithfulness through this study, just to show us your commitment to keeping your promises, to show us your gracious hand in selecting those who, in and of themselves, Lord, have nothing that would make you desire us. Father, you are faithful, you are building. You are worthy to be worshipped. 
I pray that we would be a new generation, not like Israel, but Father, a generation that would say whatever it costs, however we can serve, being willing to be faithful even when we cannot see the end result, that you would be honored and glorified and that on that day we could lay before you anything that we've worked on that it might be worthy of you. In Jesus' name, amen.